Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Salman Basit, and together with my colleague uh, Philip Estes and some of the colleagues who could not make here, Stefan Berger and Dimitrios Spenderakis, we'll be giving an overview of uh, Docker uh, security. And Docker, as you know, is becoming very popular, going into Magnum. People are building services around it, and security of Docker is a major concern. So hopefully with this talk, uh, you'll walk away with an understanding of what Docker security is about and how we can build a cloud service uh, using Docker. All right, so good afternoon. Um, first of all, I think um, I won't belabor the agenda because obviously we'll walk through it as we go, but um, we're gonna briefly talk about um, what is Docker and I, I hope to approach it from a slightly different angle that will help us kind of walk through the rest of the talk that'll make more sense for looking at threat models, how do you protect against them, how do we configure Docker and related components uh, best to handle the kind of attacks that, that you might see. And then uh, Solomon will wrap it up uh, with kind of some lessons learned uh, that we've had. But uh, before that, uh, definitely we'd like to acknowledge the IBM uh, container service team uh, who have done a lot of work to, to run a production deployment um, in, in a public cloud. Uh, obviously, we've worked hand in hand with the Docker community, with the OpenStack community, with uh, obviously the Linux community. There's a lot of moving parts as we get into this of all these layers of um, software pieces that are, that are part of, of having a secure way to run containers. So we will um, walk through that with you. But first of all, I, uh, again, um, I think in most talks on containers at the conference, there's an opening um, question about, you know, who's heard of containers and everyone raises their hand. We all kind of generally understand uh, what they are. But, uh, you know, a, a minor pet peeve of mine is that the same kind of image has been used uh, as long as I've been around Docker. Um, and I, I guess as far as an introduction, I work in the upstream Docker community on behalf of IBM as a uh, core maintainer in the Docker engine. And so I work uh, closely with Docker Inc. through our partnership with them and also with the broader uh, community. But anyway, a lot, of, a lot of folks approach, you know, this initial what is Docker with this image of, you know, you remove the hypervisor and we share kind of these layers and there's your binaries and libraries and your app. And, uh, you know, things can be smaller. They're not these gigabyte images. And th those things are all very true. Um, and definitely some of the space and cost savings in uh, increased performance, uh, definitely all those things are true. But I think a good um, foundation for what we want to talk about today is to see Docker as its actual isolation components that make up a container. And, and that's what makes it hard to really describe a container is that it's not one unique thing. It's a set of isolation technologies, uh, mostly residing in the Linux kernel. Um, and uh, if you want to know more, I know James Bottomley has a talk uh, later this afternoon that's great on, on digging, deep diving into, into those components, those I isolation technologies that you find not just in Docker, but in LXC and other container technologies. Um, so really, uh, you know, a container is composed of a system that can assemble those things in a, um, in a model where it feels like you're in your own system. And so uh, in the Docker world, someone sitting down and typing Docker run Redis or Nginx uh, feels like you're starting in, in some ways like a VM. Uh, you have a root file system and you can install tools in there. Um, but, it, but in Docker's case, there's an engine that's actually in that time assembling uh, that root file system, whether it's pulling an image from Docker Hub or from a private registry um, and assembling the C groups and namespaces and capabilities, et cetera, to create what you think of as a container. Now, we know Docker has grown beyond just that core engine that most people know about and the Docker Hub to include things like Compose and Swarm and Machine and, and all these other advanced uh, capabilities that are coming around even beyond Docker when we look at Kubernetes and Mesos. Uh, but this talk, we're going to focus looking at containers and container security uh, specifically. 
obviously, if you uh, run Docker, um, there, there are various deployment models you might have. The simplest being, I've got a host or a set of hosts that I control all those aspects of it. Uh, the code that I run in those in those containers on those hosts is known. Maybe it's mine. I'm a single tenant, and uh, maybe it runs on bare metal or a VM. But anyway, I'm sort of in c control of that universe. Whereas there's the multi-tenant model where I no longer am in control of all the containers running. There may be multiple tenants. The code running there may be unknown. Uh, they may be running on the same machine with virtual networks. Uh, maybe the Docker API is exposed to various tenants. And so this model is actually much more like a VM-based multi-tenant cloud, like a public cloud offering. And that's going to be our focus because that's what we're running in the IBM Container Service. That's where we have our experience of, of these challenges. And obviously the security challenge increases as we move uh, toward this model of a multi-tenant uh, we don't know and trust all the things that we're running. So Salman is going to take it from there and talk about the threat models. Okay. So um, when you are running a, a public cloud uh, using Docker containers, there are various types of threats uh, that you have to guard against. And the first one being that, you know, if... Uh, uh, innocent user is running containers on a machine in your public cloud, can it be attacked by some other malicious users running in container, running apps in containers uh, on the same machine as, as this user? So what are some of the possible attacks? So let's say I'm running a container on, on a machine in a cloud. Uh, so can other containers see uh, which containers I have started or what are the processes running inside uh, this container? Uh, then, uh, then which files are used? Can other containers see which files are used uh, by my container? Ideally, they should not be able to do that. Uh, a container is typically configured with a network stack. So if I'm using some specific networking, IPs, uh, virtual networking, can other uh, containers see uh, that network stack? Know, what is the host name of, of uh, my container? Can other containers uh, see the host name? Can they set the host name? And you know, are, uh, if my containers are doing IPC, you know, no, nobody does IPC these days, but you know, if containers were doing IPC, uh, can other containers see, uh, IPC stands for inter-process communication, so can, can other containers see how my containers are communicating with some other containers I'm running on the same host or um, across source if the IPC is Im implemented across source. So, so that's a, a example. these are examples of attacks that other containers running on the same machine can, can attack another container. So rock containers can also attack the physical host on which they are running. And you know, such containers, you know, you, you know, these, these can be rock containers, but these can also be misconfigured containers. So what are some of the examples? Um, so with containers, um, uh, you know, is a root uh, running inside a container also a root user on the host? And that's very important to understand because you know, when, you get, when you create a container, unlike virtual machines, uh, there is no separate kernel running. It's essentially a Linux uh, process that's, uh, that's running. And uh, so if a Linux user inside that kernel is, is root, and if that's the same uh, user on the host, there is potential for, uh, for exploitation over there. Then are the CPU, memory, and network limits that are configured for this container, are they being obeyed? You know, is, is the container going to uh, violate those limits? Uh, can a container gain privileged capabilities? So a container can be configured a Docker containers can be started with the so-called privileged capabilities by which they have access to uh, the capabilities of a root user on the host. Uh, are other limits obeyed such as uh, the, you know, uh, creating a number of child processes or a number of file descriptors? You know, containers, um, you've seen stuff uh, in the wild uh, and it's an issue across many different Container-based platforms such as Cloud Foundry uh, and Docker containers and, and LXEs that misconfigured containers 
our malicious containers can create lots and lots of uh, processes. And, and finally, uh, you know, can a container mount a, a denial of service uh, uh, attack on, on the host uh, or can it try to mount the file systems of, uh, of uh, other containers? And finally, the third type of threat we want to talk about is you know, uh, the attacks from public internet. So you know, I'm an innocent user. I deployed my container on the public cloud and I hope it to run, but it can potentially be attacked uh, from the public internet. And some of the examples include scanning of ports, uh, guessing passwords, my containers, uh, doing denial of service. And this threat model is similar to uh, what we have to, for a VM-based cloud. So this is not going to, we're not going to talk about that, and we'll focus mostly on the first two threat models, namely protecting containers, um, namely uh, con uh, raw containers attacking other containers and raw containers attacking the host. So isolating from other containers. How can we make sure that we isolate uh, one container from the other? So Docker relies on uh, kernel namespaces for uh, isolating um, containers from other containers. So with the kernel namespaces for process IDs, for mount, for network, for UTS and for IPC, uh, other containers are unable to see which processes I'm running inside my containers. Other containers are also unable to see which files I'm using. Uh, they cannot see the network stack. Uh, they cannot see any IPC communication and they, they are unable to set or get the host name of, of my container. Um, and um, you know, another question that gets asked is, okay, so these are nice capabilities, but what are, about devices? You know, if my host has various devices, such as our DMA or others, uh, can containers access them? So the devices have to be explicitly passed inside into the, into the Docker container using the device uh, option. But all of these things that are described here, uh, they are moot uh, if a user can create privileged containers on the host. And a privileged container is, is something that has full access uh, uh, to the capabilities of the host, similar to what a root user has. Um, so, so then, um, yeah, so that's you know, isolating from, from the host, um, isolating from other containers. And then there is this big issue of how do, I, I, how do we isolate a host from raw containers? And here, as you can see, there are a bunch of uh, capabilities, uh, mostly in Linux kernel, that are used uh, to isolate raw containers from the host. Uh, they're being user namespaces, C groups, Linux capabilities, Linux security modules, SecComp, Docker API, and Docker engine and storage configuration. Now, Phil is going to talk about uh, user namespaces, which he uh, actually implemented uh, in Docker uh, uh, 1.9. So yeah, as Solomon said, uh, user namespaces are a, uh, I guess I'll say a new feature in Docker. They actually aren't in the Docker main release uh, yet. They're currently in the experimental release. Uh, Docker 1.9 is in release candidate form this week and uh, probably will come out uh, generally next week. But the experimental build uh, in the 1.9 release cycle has user namespace support and, and probably at least for our talk, the, the key benefit that we'd like to discuss here is that um, I'm now able to deprivilege this root inside the container from being root um, outside the container. Uh, in this example, uh, if I run a container and I mount a, a directory that has files owned by the root of my host, uh, now obviously, hopefully you wouldn't do that, uh, but we need to show some kind of, <laughs> some kind of example where you'd have access to do a malicious uh, attack on the host. And in this case, if I had access to a directory in today's model without user namespaces when I Docker run my container, if I have access to a directory, I could actually replace uh, the shell with my own malicious shell, or I could uh, copy in a file uh, from my container on, onto the host. Uh, but in this example, um, Basically, that's prevented because, as you can see over here, if I'm running this container and I look at its PID and I look at the, the, the UID 
uh, of the um, user running my shell in my container, which is what I've run by running BusyBox, I can see that that's not actually root. And I think I, I was going to demonstrate, and maybe we'll save it for the end in case we have time, but since we have quite a few things to cover, uh, maybe we'll skip it for now and see if we have time. Uh, but the important thing here to take away from user namespaces is that um, now when I run a container by default, the root, at least the, the container still has privileges as root, but it's not uh, able to access files or any of the processes as root if it were able to break out of the container. Is that right? uh, no, you have to start the Docker daemon with a remap root turned on. Now, the Docker uh, community hopes that that will become a default once we sort out a lot of um, issues with volumes and linking. And, and there are other issues that, that come out of, of having unique root UIDs. But yes, uh, that's, that's the plan. OK, so uh, now we have these containers which um, uh, yeah. You know, due to kernel namespaces, they cannot see what I'm running inside my container. With user namespaces, uh, my root inside a container is not a root inside the host. Now, let's talk about resource isolation. Uh, you know, if I'm running a container, uh, uh, those containers use resources. They use CPU, they use memory, they may use disk, uh, they may use network. Uh, and if uh, the appropriate resource limits are not defined, uh, then uh, malicious containers have the potential to cripple the host on which uh, they are running. So in this example, uh, uh, this shows a machine with eight CPUs and there's a container running which has these two CPUs defined. Uh, uh, a container is running and the container is started such that um, uh, only the first two CPUs of the physical machine are allocated to this, uh, this container with the CPU set command, as you can see. Uh, then, you know, at the time of Docker container creation, one can also specify the CPU share a container will get. By default, uh, each uh, process that is started in Linux gets a, a, a share of uh, 1024. So one can define these shares relative to that default value. So in other words, if I'm running one container with a default share and another container with a share of 512, uh, and both are trying to consume uh, the same amount of CPU, this container that has started using this command will be only able to use um, half of the CPU relative to the other container. So that's the CPU isolation. Then there's the memory and the swap. Right? How do we make sure, uh, how does Docker make sure that uh, a container is going to obey the memory limits. And first of all, here there is the uh, there's the way uh, memory and swap are configured in a Docker container. So note at the syntax of uh, of the command here that memory is configured as 2G and memory swap is configured as 2G. Swap the way Docker command is defined, it really configure configures swap on top of this additional additional memory. So in this case. It is essentially you using zero swap memory um, uh, because the main memory that is defined for the container is two gig. If the swap was configured as three gigabytes, then a gigabyte swap will be configured for, for the Docker. And uh, one of the problems with, with the memory uh, isolation is that uh, you know, by default in Linux kernel, the memory accounting, memory and swap accounting is not enabled. So if that's not enabled, containers have the potential to you know, consume more, more uh, memory. And, and moreover, uh, uh, so, so they can consume more, more memory, and the out-of-memory killer will kick in and kill, kill the, the, those containers. But you know, there is the issue of the containers not obeying uh, the memory limit. Um, then there is the disk. Uh, containers writing data to disk. Um, uh, if I'm running, if you're running, you know, hundreds of containers on the same machine, all trying to write data to their file systems, um, uh, you know, they can also potentially cripple the disk. So it's, it's a good practice to use different disks for containers versus root file systems, and moreover, define uh, limits on how much uh, data containers can write uh, to to the disk. 
Um, the block IO, which is part of C groups, it can be configured, but there are some challenges and problems in configuring and ensuring that the, the limits for this IO are appropriately defined. Finally, there is the network uh, uh, piece. With, with containers, one can use different types of networking, uh, using lib containers, using courier. Um, so you know, if one is using Neutron, for example, uh, the, the traffic uh, shipping uh, capabilities, or, uh, which define limits on how much uh, a virtual machine or how much traffic can be sent on a port uh, is, is configured. Um, and uh, by, you know, by default, uh, the network names, the C groups for networks are not, are not defined inside inside Docker. Uh, so if you're going to use default Docker networking, you have to make sure that those limits are appropriately defined. So, so this slide kind of summarizes uh, what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the key point being that uh, among uh, you know besides the CPU, kernel, memory, and disk, there's also the issue of um, you know processes, containers trying to do fork bombs. And there are many ways of controlling that, and one possible way is through C groups. Uh, the C groups for uh, process IDs or PIDs uh, support does not exist in kernel yet, but it's coming soon in kernel 4.3. There are also some challenges on enforcing uh, the, the uh, uh, data traffic for the block devices. Uh, and so some of these and, and issues are being addressed uh, in, in C group version uh, V2, which has seen a lot of contributions from the Facebook engineering teams. And with the redesign interface and a new hierarchical organization, hopefully some of the problems that we've seen with C groups um, uh, are going to go away. And those uh, can then be leveraged directly by the Docker for improved resource isolation. So that's on the resource side. Uh, now let's talk about the capabilities. So you know, again, going back to the old story that, uh, going back to the story that containers cannot see what's running, they are isolated from the root, their resource is isolated, but they may still have all the capabilities for executing various, various system calls, right? Uh, kernels by default share the kernel, uh, sorry, containers by default share the kernel with, with the host. And if they can execute various types of system calls, um, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that can be exploited by, uh, by a hacker to potentially gain access to, to the root. So uh, to protect against that, the first line of defense is Linux capabilities. So make sure that the containers, um, and, and what Linux capabilities do is that, you know, in the, in the old days, there used to be just two types of users, root and not root, and root will have all the capabilities. Uh, but starting, I think, in Linux kernel 2.26.22 uh, or, or, or somewhere nearby, uh, the Linux capabilities were defined such that uh, uh, the, all the privileges of root user were broken down into a smaller set of capabilities. So what are those capabilities? Uh, for example, the ability to, to load a kernel module. Can a, can a Docker container load a kernel module? Can it mount file systems? Can it, uh, can it perform network administration uh, operations? So Docker by default, you know, there are about 37 capabilities and, and Docker um, uh, drops a majority of them. And uh, you know, the numbers are not important here. It depends on, the, on the, uh, how powerful a capability here is. Uh, but but you know in this example of, uh, so because the Docker um, uh, drops the mount capability, the the figure shows that a Docker container is unable to mount a, a file system, but um, it can perform the regular I/O operations using open and, and close. So you know uh, Linux capabilities. So so that's great. You know I can we can restrict how much capabilities are available to a process. Uh, but that's that's not enough. Um, we would like to be able to use uh, the Linux security modules, such as App Armor or SC Linux, to restrict what uh, what is available for a Docker, uh, what a Docker container can do. And uh, you know, a popular a popular platform for running Docker containers is Ubuntu, and on Ubuntu, App Armor is the popular choice for uh, for uh, uh, for a Linux security module. So. In a nutshell, what does App Armor do? 
So previously, as we saw, said, uh, saw with the capabilities that we can restrict, you know, you know, which system calls or sets of system calls um, a container can execute. Now with App Armor, one can define that within that system call, such as opening a file, uh, which of those files can actually be opened by a container. So we can say that uh, you know a container can open in this example at host, but it is denied access to uh, the dev uh, K KMM. And Docker has a default App Armor profile for um, for containers, and it provides protection against. Uh, it, it makes sure that a user uh, a, a, a user that breaks out of a container cannot access the uh, sensitive data on the host, such as uh, you know the Linux the files associated with uh, Linux security modules, um, or uh, or kernel uh, memory, etc. Uh, but one can also choose to define a custom App Armor uh, profile for. Uh, uh, for uh, different types of containers that uh, runs on on the host. Okay, so uh, you know, isolated containers, limited capabilities, uh, C groups for resource isolation uh, restrictions, uh, using App Armor. Uh, one thing I did not mention when I, I spoke about capabilities is that sometimes capabilities are implemented using a series of system calls. Right. In this case, uh, there's an example here. The set UID capability has four system calls that uh, that are used, uh, that can be used by a um, by a, a, a container. So there is a technology called SecComp that can be used to limit which system calls uh, can are invoked by a Docker container. So we can restrict uh, and isolate. Uh, um, you know containers uh, in in that uh, way, and 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 lastly, uh, uh, not lastly, but uh, I should mention that all of this this work that we have done so far in securing uh, our host, uh, protecting our host from raw containers, uh, that that is all useless if a user can create uh, privileged containers. You know, Docker by uh, the current Docker API allows a a user to create privileged containers. And you know, there is work in progress in the Docker community to create appropriate authentication and authorization for that. But until then, if you want to build a multi-tenant container cloud, um, you have to make sure that a user does not have the ability to create privileged containers or add capabilities um, uh, or changing the, the Linux security module profiles associated uh, with the container. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Sure. Um, so just to step back for one second to SecComp. So everything we talked about in that section exists in Docker today. SecComp uh, has been um, put into Run C. I don't know how many this week have heard about the Open Container Initiative. LibContainer is sort of the underlying library that does a lot of the low-level work to start a Docker container. SecComp support has been added there but it's not in Docker uh, yet. So I think Docker 1.10 will probably have the set comp capabilities. Um, so we've talked about all those limitations we can place. Um, now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the Docker engine itself uh, and ways to isolate and, and configure it properly. So obviously using uh, TLS for communication with the Docker engine, if you're opening up the API over a, um, a TCP socket, um, there is documentation on uh, doc on how to set up TLS certificates. There are various modes of whether you're validating with that or actually doing client um, authorization with that, and and that's sort of um, not full featured yet. But as Solomon said, there's actually two proposals right now to add a full authorization and authentication to the Docker daemon and client. Um, but you can check out the current TLS support in the documentation. Obviously, you want to set appropriate limits. Uh, some of the things we've talked about, limiting um, opening uh, huge amounts of file, resources, number of processes. Um, and there's a good tool that the Docker community and Docker Inc. Uh, security team have been working on, uh, the CIS benchmark. We have the link here. And the Docker Bench tool, which was announced at DockerCon this summer, 
Um, uh, and there's a lot of links in our slides, and, and obviously uh, some of you have been taking pictures, but we'll also post these on SlideShare so you can easily get to a lot of these resources later. Uh, but anyway, the Docker Bench tool is very useful for running through a set of recommended um, uh, security check checks on your configuration. And then as many of you know, uh, the Docker storage um, setup is configurable. There are many back-end um, storage drivers available. Um, a couple of our experiences consider using Device Mapper, which is block versus file oriented. Um, if it's possible in your environment, setting the default file system of containers to read only, which of course you can use volumes for uh, for data if you need write access to to areas, you can use uh, volumes for that. And then uh, something Solomon has worked on uh, upstream, uh, bind mounted files in Docker have no quota. So again, uh, that's another loophole for uh, a malicious container to try and and basically DOS your host. Uh, if you can make those read only, that limits that, that capability. Um, and then also in that ecosystem we showed at the beginning, um, the Docker registry is a key component, whether you're running a private registry, uh, obviously Docker Hub is running the V2 um, implementation, but if you are uh, using your own registry, uh, the images that you're going to run are obviously going to be pulled from your registry. And uh, currently the V1 registry is deprecated um, and will probably uh, in a couple of Docker releases go out of, uh, actually the Docker engine will have, uh, will disallow access to the V1 registry mainly because of its original weaknesses. Um, there are many blog posts on these topics you can find yourself, I think, uh, we're running a little short on time, so I won't, I won't delve into what you can read here, but the V2 API and the implementation in Go uh, were worked on earlier this year uh, in the community. Docker 1.6 uh, was the first uh, engine release which officially supported the V2 API. Uh, the most important piece being that now all content is addressable with a strong cryptographic hash rather than the random layer IDs in V1. So now you can have safe distribution and signing and verification is now available. I don't know how many people have heard of Notary. Um, Docker Content Trust is kind of the, the branding Docker has put around that, but the Notary tool now allows, allows for full signing and verification through that and there's some great demos if you look back at the DockerCon July content on what that can prevent um, as far as malicious attacks on your registry data. Um, and again, there are also performance improvements uh, because now these digests and the manifests that describe them allow for an easier path to, to pulling all the content for an image. Um, so that's a quick overview of the, um, the engine configuration and registry. And Solomon's going to go on to uh, potential attacks. Right. So when you're running containers, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, one uh, common problem seen across different types of containers is fork bomb. Containers you know, misconfigured or malicious can just try to create a lot of processes. So there has to be appropriate protection against that. And as I mentioned that with kernel, Linux kernel 4.3, uh, limiting the number of processes that can be created um, using C groups, uh, that support will be coming uh, there. But until then, you have to use your own custom solution uh, to protect against that. Uh, there are resource exhaustion attacks. So there are three types of files that are so-called bind mounted inside a container. So you know, there are no resource file, uh, there are no quotas defined on these files. And um, you know, again, there are multiple solutions. One can, can make the, the whole file system read only or have some uh, watchdog demons to protect against, uh, against that. And, and lastly, and, and this is perhaps very important, that all of the good things we have done uh, cannot protect uh, the, uh, a container uh, from, uh, misconfigura from a user misconfiguration. Uh, uh, so for example, if you know, a user deploys a package, Nginx or MySQL, expose it on the internet, uh, does not use strong passwords, or does not follow the appropriate uh, 
um, guidelines for configuring and deploying their application securely. Those applications running inside containers can get hacked uh, over the internet. You know, this is similar to what can also happen for virtual machines, uh, for applications deployed inside virtual machines. So to put it all uh, all together, you know, starting from the top, um, uh, it's important uh, uh, to restrict the Docker API calls uh, that are uh, that are out there and you know, differentiate between certain operations that can be used to create privileged containers versus uh, non-privileged containers. Uh, it's best, as Philip was describing, to use uh, the Docker version two registry as it has support for cryptographic hash of image layers. Um, you know, Docker uses uh, kernel namespaces for isolating containers from, from, from other containers. You have to make sure that uh, all containers actually do end up using kernel, na kernel namespaces and cannot arbitrarily drop um, uh, the use of, of this. Uh, C groups are used for resource isolation uh, and they, uh, they can be, you know, improved uh, and they will be improved with the changes in Linux kernel as well as the, in the new version of, uh, of C groups. Uh, there's already a limited set of capabilities that Docker uses uh, uh, and uh, you know, one can define, one can further restrict the capabilities available to a, uh, Docker containers depending on the deployment model uh, for, a, for a container offering. Um, so you know one one aspect about uh, containers is that containers do share the kernel with the host unlike vms they are not you know unlike applications running inside vms which have their own kernel and then they run on the host which has its own kernel Kern, uh, containers share the kernel with the host but the important thing to keep in mind here is that um, um, because of the restrictions uh, because we limit the capabilities available to a, a to containers, because we, def we can define uh, uh, Linux security module profiles for restricting file uh, or capabilities access, and because we can further restrict uh, what uh, can be used, uh, which system calls can be invoked, uh, one can greatly reduce the attack surface uh, and in, uh, for uh, for containers. And obviously, with, with user namespaces, with uh, containers running uh, as, as non-root on the host, you know, that provides uh, additional protection. So I mentioned about user namespaces. Um, one has to make sure that uh, the Docker engine is appropriately configured, uh, some of the things we talked about earlier, that appropriate Linux security modules are defined, um, uh, that one follows the host uh, best practices, uh, for uh, securing a host, um, uh, and uh, you know, one can also consider using hardware-assisted uh, verification and isolation. And there has been some great work happening in the community on using um, TPM uh, for uh, verifying uh, the host, verifying the images on the host, verifying. Uh, containers and, and there are several talks from from our colleagues in Intel uh, about uh, about that. But the, the important point is that whatever you do, make sure that uh, you, you define ap appropriate security tests and you run them within your cloud environment before putting stuff into production, so that all those limits and all those uh, configurations we defined are indeed being uh, being followed. So here, you know, we have put together a series of links uh, on, on, on these topics. Uh, hopefully you find uh, the talk useful. And uh, I guess at this point, uh, we have, we've, we'll open up to questions. Yeah, I think we have uh, hmm, two minutes. <laughs> so. A quick question. You mentioned that uh, block IO limits. Wasn't that enforced only if the actual block scheduler on the device was CFP? So I guess the block, uh, there is the block IO limits and then how the block IO, IO limits are currently configured in the C groups for, for Docker. Um, uh, first of all, uh, only the, buffer, uh, the limits for direct IO are enforced. The buffered IO limits are not enforced. And for direct IO, some of the options that are available don't quite work well and they depend on the Linux kernel version. So, so there are some, some issues there.
Yeah, that, that's why there's some C group improvement that's still coming that will hopefully improve, you know, some of those weaknesses that we mentioned. So, yes. Uh, there are a lot of options that you can configure in the security, right? So how do you see this getting integrated with, from an open stack perspective? Like some can be managed by Kubernetes management solutions, some security can be configured through Keystone or anything, right? Is there any integration work or even a tool that can <coughs> do that? I, yeah, I assume some some of that will have to come through, like Magnum, for example, that where there's some integration about how how a pod is is deployed and and what's going to configure um, those settings. And I, you know, I think we have folks involved. I'm not directly involved in Magnum, but we have uh, some from our broader IBM team, where some of the lessons we're learning uh, hopefully get implemented there as well, and that information is shared. Um, that's not not a perfect answer, but I, yes, I, I think there has to be that sharing of you know how, how do we configure these so that everyone's not doing things a different way and missing some key um, issues that that may leak through if someone doesn't understand how you know the best practice. Okay. I think we're over limit. Um, this is sort of, uh, I've got this headset on that makes me feel like I should sell something, but this is, this is free. Uh, if you do want a postcard, this is not related to security or Docker, but uh, open source and open governance uh, has been kind of a, a keystone of IBM's involvement in OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, Docker. So this is a book that, that myself and a colleague wrote. It's an ebook form. If you want a download link, I've got postcards. If you don't, that's fine too. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, two, two for one for the next five minutes. Uh, I will, I will tweet the slide share week, slide share link of the talk. Uh, at Estes P is my um, Twitter handle, and I'll throw in some hashtags to make it findable, maybe. <laughs> Thank you.